What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we are looking at nutrient timing and meal timing. Does it matter for fat loss? But first, like, subscribe, comment, algorithm, you know the drill. All right, so a really cool new paper just came out in Cell. This paper was looking at the influence of consuming more of your food in the morning versus the evening and how that affected fat loss, appetite, energy expenditure, and a myriad of different things. Previous studies looking at bigger morning meals versus bigger evening meals have kind of started to become popular because some of them have shown that having bigger morning meals might be better for fat loss. In fact, there was a study years ago that showed a massive difference in weight loss over 12 weeks, even though there was supposedly no difference in calories with one group eating way more in the morning and another group eating way more in the evening. And I remember reviewing this study and thinking, this just doesn't seem physiologically possible. I mean, they were talking about the same amount of calories, but I mean, basically what you're looking at is like a pound of weight difference a week. So you'd have to have like a 500 calorie increase in energy expenditure to explain this. So one of the drawbacks to these previous studies is they've been free living. And there's nothing wrong with a free living study, but we know people don't accurately track their caloric intake. And we do know that temporal changes in eating pattern, like intermittent fasting, even though the study was not intermittent fasting, can have a satiety inducing effect. So it's very possible people thought they were eating the calories they were supposed to, but actually were consuming less. So this study was actually the first really tightly controlled study looking at whether or not where you eat your food during the day matters for fat loss and a host of other things. So this study was great in that they equated calories and it was very highly controlled in that they provided all the meals to the participants. Not only that, but they instructed participants that if they did not finish a meal, that they weigh it out and send them the data. And at the end of the study, I mean, they basically showed that there was no difference in caloric intake between the groups. Very tightly controlled. Now it was only four weeks, but again, they're doing a bunch of measurements and they're providing them with all the meals. That sort of level of control is difficult to maintain for long periods of time. And also these sorts of studies tend to be very expensive. And so they were measuring like total daily energy expenditure with doubly labeled water. They were measuring basal metabolic rate with metabolic chamber and indirect calimetry. They were measuring the thermic effect of food. They were measuring physical activity. They had the participants wear accelerometers. They also measured various hormones. So they measured a ton of stuff. And so while some people may criticize the four week duration, for the amount of stuff they measured, it was a very appropriate study and I thought it was very well done and very cool. So how did they vary the nutrition between these groups? Well, first off, what I really liked is they had them all do a run-in diet. Each group did the same diet coming into the experiment for the week before the experiment started. Then they were randomized into two groups. They did either a morning load, which they titled ML, or an evening load titled EL. The differences between them were having either 45%, 35%, and 20% of their calories at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or the reverse, 20%, 35%, and 45% at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All the diets had the same macronutrient composition. They were 30% protein, 35% carbohydrate, and 35% fat. So again, really strong study design in that they're equating macros, they're providing meals, and they're equating calories. And this was also a crossover design where each person acted as their own control, which again, increases the strength of the data. So what I mean by that is they had them do a one week run-in diet, then they randomized them to the test diets for four weeks, then they had them do a one week washout period where they all consumed the same diet and then they flipped them and each person consumed the opposite diet for another four weeks. So the total length of time was actually 10 weeks. Very strong study design because when each person functions as their own control, now you eliminate genetic differences between people. This is the first study looking at nutrient timing or chrononutrition and measuring all components of energy expenditure. They measured resting metabolic rate, they measured the thermic effect of food, they measured physical activity. So they're covering all the bases and they measured total daily energy expenditure with doubly labeled water. So if there truly is a difference in the timing of how you eat, 
they should be able to find it in this study. One other thing I'll say is that the participants were obese but otherwise healthy individuals and it was basically 50-50 males and females. And they did not observe any differences between the sexes in this study. So what did they find? They found that both diets caused fat loss, weight loss, improved body composition, and improved some markers of health, but they didn't really find any differences between the two groups. One difference they did find, however, was the morning load group had better satiety throughout the day than the evening load group. If I'm to criticize this, I would say, well, they had more in the morning, so it makes sense that they'd have better satiety throughout the day compared to the evening group. I like the way they did the satiety measurements. They'd have people in the respective groups basically rate their subjective levels of hunger every 30 minutes throughout the day. Problem with this is they're only doing it for one day, this one test day. So they had them rate it from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m., which is great, but the problem is it makes sense that your morning load group would have better satiety ratings throughout the course of that day compared to the evening load group because you're only going till 10 p.m. What about the morning of the following day? And indeed, in the graphs, you can see that as the day goes on, they actually basically end up having the same subjective ratings of hunger by the end of the day. So I'm not saying that there's not a real difference there, but what I really would like to have seen is a second day after that where they took the same ratings over. Now, I'm criticizing that, but I also understand that it's not always feasible to get people to spend two days in a lab. Uh, not many of us, and certainly not me, would want to give up two days of my life to sit around and rate my hunger for every 30 minutes. So I understand why the researchers did not do that, but I will say I think some people may put too much stock in the conclusions of the ratings of hunger. When I say they didn't really find any differences in much else, they measured, and I'm going to just go down the list, blood pressure, pulse, fasting glucose, fasting insulin, HOMA IR, which is a measure of insulin sensitivity, HbA1c, which actually if I was to criticize, I would say I wouldn't even use HbA1c just because it tends to be much more of a long-term marker that takes around 120 days to really start seeing differences in, but whatever. Cholesterol, HDL, LDL, non-esterified fatty acids, triglycerides, total daily energy expenditure, resting metabolic rate, the thermic effect of food, physical activity as measured by these accelerometers, as well as their average daily steps and their sleep duration. They didn't see differences in hardly anything. The only thing that they saw a difference in was a slight difference in non-esterified fatty acids, which was greater in the morning load group and slightly higher HDL in the morning load group as well. However, they take these measurements in the morning which is important to keep in mind. And the groups with the evening load are having a bigger meal at night. It is possible that that influenced some of these measures and may explain these small but significant differences. But like I said, when it comes to energy expenditure, they didn't see any differences. Energy expenditure was basically almost the exact same and the components of energy expenditure were the same, except for the thermic effect of food, which was greater with the morning meal, but that's only because they only measured the thermic effect of food after the morning meal, and we know that the thermic effect of food is primarily influenced by the size of the meal, and the researchers said as much. They basically said they don't believe that there's any difference in the thermic effect of food uh, with morning versus evening feeding, and that you were basically just seeing an effect of the meal size. So none of the measurements of energy expenditure point to any differences in caloric output by changing your nutrient timing. They also looked at the degree of metabolic adaptation. So the slowing of RMR with weight loss. And again, they found no differences between the two groups. Both groups had a slight slowing of RMR, but it was not different between the groups. They also looked at physical activity in terms of steps per day, as well as the accelerometer data. Once again, found absolutely no differences. So one of the things we can conclude from this paper is it seems pretty clear that under controlled circumstances, the timing of your nutrition does not appear to affect energy expenditure. Now, they did see differences in uh, the hormone ghrelin with the breakfast meal having a greater inhibitory effect on ghrelin than the evening load group. 
Now, the reason I said it that way is because they measured it two hours after the breakfast meal. So once again, of course, ghrelin is going to be lower after the breakfast meal because it is a larger meal in that group. I'd be very surprised if they saw differences in terms of 24 hour ghrelin, but they didn't measure that. And again, it's not a slam on the researchers. I understand why you would have to basically blood sample people on the hour every hour in order to get a nice daily area under the curve. They also measured a few other anorectic hormones like GIP and again saw that two hours after the breakfast meal that was better in the morning load group. But again, they ate more food during the morning load group, so it makes more sense that they would be more satiated. Once again, until we get like an area under a curve of a 24 hour of these hormones, I'm just not super impressed by this data. Again, I'm not slamming the study. I think it was a really cool study and really elegantly designed and well done. I think within the framework of the constraints they had, they did really well. But again, it's just pointing out the limitation and the possibility for over-interpretation by people who are reading this paper. So I'm gonna kind of finish here with a conclusion by the authors where they say, our study disproves earlier studies that infer time of day calorie intake may influence energy balance through metabolic adaptation and instead implies that changes in appetite may be involved in improving weight loss with morning load feedings. Now, what's my takeaway for you guys? This paper doesn't really surprise me. The authors seem to think that possibly some of these effects we're seeing with the chrononutrition based free living studies that showed greater weight loss with bigger feedings in the morning may be just an effect of appetite suppression. And that very well could be true. I think we need a little bit more research before we can definitively make that conclusion but I think that this was a nice study to add to the body of research literature. What does it mean for you? If you try eating more in the morning and you find that that suppresses your appetite throughout the day and you're not hungry at night, do that. If you're like me and you find that if you eat a lot earlier in the day, you're actually pretty hungry at night, don't do that. Your results may vary. So do what appears to work for you. All right, guys, if you like these study breakdowns, make sure you subscribe to my new research review, Reps, which is Research Explained and Practical Summaries, where we take five studies every month that are popular in fitness and nutrition like this, and we break them down in a way that's palatable and easy to understand without a bunch of unnecessary scientific jargon, and we give you practical takeaways at the end of each article in terms of what it means for you, how it fits with the body of scientific literature, and we'll even tell you if we agree with the researchers' conclusions, do we think that they tested appropriately for what they wanted to measure and whether or not their conclusions actually match the results they got. So if you guys are interested in that, please click the link in the description to sign up for reps and I will catch you next week.